there's a sign in set of Jim today and we're going to have to find the So please make sure you get your assignments in over here, assignment two. Assignment one is returned over here, and the solutions for them are posted on the course website as well. Assignment three will be posted soon, and that's going to be due about a week. From now. Let's quick recap what uh, Claudia covered in the last class. So we were looking at filtration, and filtration is movement of fluid through a packed bed. So it makes sense that when we're looking at that, we go back to some of our earlier work we've studied and start from there as our baseline. And that's in fact how these equations were derived originally. So they start from the Brazil law, which is uh, up there, and simple substitution of term for term in the context of fluid flow through a packed bed. So this first equation appears for flow through a straight tube, no resistance of length LC. Now, through a packed bed, the length is slightly modified, the velocity is slightly modified, and the resistance experienced by the fluid as it flows through that packed bed is going to be modified. And that's really what this equivalence is of these two equations, which then the second one is called the common Pizzini equation. We modify particularly the velocity and we account for the fact that there's movement through a bed of solids which is packed with a certain void fraction, E or epsilon. And in this term, the diameter of the tube, which was the original derivation, now the particles are not traveling through a tube anymore of a fixed diameter. There's, there's a pathway through which they travel. And we will derive, oh sorry, we will state without derivation, that that diameter, the effective diameter through which the fluid moves is given by that term over there. It's a fairly straightforward derivation and it's in every textbook on filtration. We'll show you how to get to that equation. Two things though that are important about that equation is that we rely on knowledge of the packed bed density, or void fraction as we'll more correctly call it, and S0, the specific surface area per unit volume of the particles. These are two parameters which we cannot possibly predict ahead of time, except for the most arbitrary, unrealistic cases. So we have to resort to experimental work to determine what epsilon is, that void fraction, and we also do not know what the area of our particles are per unit volume. So take one unit volume of particles, what is the area covered by those particles? We cannot predict that from, from first principles. So two terms in there already that are going to give us problems. LC is the length of our bed, or the height of our pack bed. That's easy to measure. Delta P, easy to measure. K1, a constant viscosity of the fluid from you. Easy terms to measure. So let's, uh, we kept on going. One thing that is um, helpful for us is to do a derivation of what that height of pack bed is, LC. For a given unit, we saw some examples last class, the packed, um, sorry, the, the plate and frame filter press. Okay, so that's a closed unit. Let's just quickly visualize what that looks like again. Here was an example that Claudia showed from a beer manufacturing. They produce a variety of beers, but all their final product passes through this plate and frame press. We cannot measure in real time what the length of that cake is. That cake thickness, LC, cannot be determined. We have no way of, of estimating that. But we can get LC through a mass balance. So if we know our slurry concentration, what is the percent solids in there, or more correctly, <coughs> mass of solids per unit volume of liquid, that's easy to measure up front. We can know that. We can then derive a formula for that height of the pack bed LC, knowing the cross-sectional area A. So Claudia showed us that last class, and we ended up with that formula <coughs> over there. Again, a function of this problematic term epsilon, which we're going to have to estimate from experimental work. But what it does give us is it gives us a mechanism to get LC, the thickness of that pack bed, in terms of other variables which we can measure. So we did a bit of exercise, and then we substituted it in that LC term that's rearranged over there from that previous mass balance, expressed now the length of the cake in terms of the concentration of the slurry, the volume of filtrate capital V that I will get out of the slurry, and then the cross-sectional area, which I know, density of the particles, which I know, and then again, epsilon over here, that is true. But we substituted that into the common Cosini equation, and we ended off with what we will then 
start with in today's class, where the volumetric throughput per unit time, so that's essentially Q, divided by A, this term over here on the left we call flux, is equal to the pressure drop across my cake, the, the viscosity, which I know, the solids, uh, the, the density of my slurry, the volume of my filtrate V, and then we created this new term alpha. Alpha lumps up all these problematic constants over here into one, <coughs> one single number, and that's where we're going to look at today. How do we estimate alpha? And we're going to find that alpha actually is not constant either. So we're going to have to bear that in mind and, and work around that. Okay, so things that are easy to measure over here are on the left. Things that are easy to measure over here on the right, except for alpha. That puts one of the resistances we have. So if we visualize the system again, we have our, our slurry coming down here. And here's this plate, a very, very open, porous plate. And my particles start to settle over here and form a thin layer of cake. And then they build up sequentially over time. And this layer gets thicker and thicker. So LC will grow as that batch progresses in time. There is one other resistance. So we've got the first resistance here is the resistance due to the cake, RC. But we have another resistance here, the medium itself, Rn. I said initially that that medium that we put into our cement is usually very porous. In fact, in most situations, it's surprising, the opening sizes in that medium are much larger than the particles themselves which is a little counterintuitive because those particles you would expect start to move through the medium, and they do initially to some extent. But very quickly, these particles build up a layer, and then it's actually the particles themselves that are filtering out future particles. It's not the medium itself. That, that porous medium we place down is only to create the initial layer. After that, it really has no effect on the system. So what we see in many cases is that RM is much, much smaller than RC to the extent that we actually ignore RM and the resistance it offers is ignored. And we only focus on RC, the resistance. Okay, okay. so two, two resistances, the medium itself as well as the cake. The medium is very open and porous, allowing the fluid to flow through very, very easily with no resistance, no significant pressure drop into the medium. So there's, it's offering very little resistance in the system. So the, there's a, the cake itself and there's the medium. They're in series. So we expect the sum of them is our total resistance. We know that from our physics principles. My, my point that I'm making here is that because this medium is so porous, it offers lo, little resistance. You'll find in, in practice that the RM, that resistance, is much, much smaller numerically than RC, the resistance due to the cake. So we can often ignore RM. Once the system gets going, there's a very small initial period of time where the RM might be of interest and might be important, but after a few seconds, we can easily ignore it because RC is our resistance and it really takes, takes effect. And we can see then that the height of the cake gets larger and larger. RC, that resistance, also changes and increases over time. Okay, so. What we're focusing on today is the Claudia left of last class. She derived this equation over here, where we have the flux is going to be proportional to the pressure we apply. I apply a greater driving force, I get greater flux. It's trivial. Okay, we, we, we expect it. I put more pressure difference over that system, I can get a greater flow through. I decrease my resistance, RC, due to the cake, by whatever means I have available. If I can lower that resistance, I'll get greater flow. Okay, if I can lower the viscosity of my fluid, I can increase my flow as well. So intuitively, that equation is fairly straightforward. We also stated then that if we look at the resistance due to the medium, we can come up with a similar equation, delta P through the medium this time. 
So the pressure drop over the medium is going to be a function of that filter cloth where we buy it from the size of the, the openings on that filter cloth is going to determine that filter cloth's resistance, Rm. Again, not something we can predict from first principles. Rm is something that's empirical for a given filter medium for, for certain manufacturers' <coughs> media that we purchase. We will experience some sort of pressure drop over that, fairly negligible, and that's equal to the flux as well. Okay, the same flux that passes through the cake must proceed on through the media, and so that left-hand side term dv by dt divided by the area is the same term as we saw earlier. And so what we did then last class is we simply summed up those two resistances in series and we ended up with that term over there on the right. The total pressure drop now is equal to the flux. And then I have to take into account the resistances. There's two resistances in series, so I can sum them up. Now, if Rm is much smaller than Rc, again, that denominator simplifies substantially. So let's, uh, let's just quickly look then at uh, this terminology here that you'll see from time to time. The most common filter that you experience is what's called cake filtration which is very descriptive of what's occurring is the cake that's actually doing the filtering, not the media. So as I said earlier, once that cake starts to build up, the future slurry that comes through is going to meet the cake first and going to be held back by the cake. The media is only there to create that initial layer of cake and after that, the media is really not playing a significant role in terms of the forces and, uh, sorry, in terms of the pressures. It seems clear that with all of it, what's all considered part of the cake? The cake is made up of the slurry solids that remain on above the medium. Yeah, that so comes from your feet. That comes from your feet. So it's whatever the solids are that you, you're currently filtering. And there will, be a, there will be moisture in there, obviously. Once you're done, you're not going, all that moisture that was in the slurry, most of it will land up in the filter, but there will be a certain amount of liquid trapped in your cake. So it's not a dry cake. Okay, and this principle of cake filtration applies to all these common unit ops of the filter press, the rotary vacuum, drum filter. Now, just a quick note then, we said our driving force here is the pressure difference. That delta P I apply, that's the only determination of how fast I can filter. Um, I mean, obviously the resistances play a role as well, but if I can't change those, but delta P is the one variable I have in hand to adjust. So delta P I can manipulate. Now, bear in mind that for a plate and frame filter press that you saw there in the beer clarification, so we've got our plate, that's, and then I, I put a thin layer of cloth over that, that's my medium, and then my solids build up on that. So my solids flow and then build up and form that cake on the filter cloth. Okay, so delta P then refers to that pressure drop on this side of the fluid and then leaving on the other side. For the rotary drum filter, we take out our drum. I have a thin layer of, of medium over that drum. And this drum rotates in a container of slurry. And my usual mechanism for these drums is that inside the drum, over here, I draw a vacuum. And the outside is ambient pressure. Okay. I'm emphasizing this because we'd like to just talk a bit about what that delta P represents. Delta P for the plate and frame filter press can be made fairly arbitrary. I can push it as high and as low as I like depending on the capability of my pumping mechanism here. For the vacuum case, this is ambient pressure, so atmospheric. I'm drawing a vacuum. At most, delta P can be just slightly smaller than one atmosphere, depending on the capability of my vacuum pump. But I cannot go beyond that. Right? We cannot have negative pressure. So I'm limited, my delta P is limited in the case of a vacuum drum filter to at most 0.8 of an atmosphere. You really can't draw a vacuum much stronger than that. Okay. Whereas for the plate and frame filter press, if I can go to two, three atmospheres or as much as I'm willing to spend on, 
uh, my utility costs to drive those, to drive that liquid through the solid bed. And so I can go to much, much greater pressure drops on the plate and frame filter pressure. In fact, it's required for many solids to filter are not able to be filtered on the rotary cup filter because the delta P is not going to be sufficient. So driving force is critical. That's the one variable I can't change. These resistances I can change to some extent, but not a whole lot. So let's try to, um, before I move on though, I just do want to point out this uh, type of filtration, which we're going to start to see from the next class on, is where we start to look at membranes. In a membrane system, we have what's called cross-flow filtration or tangential flow filtration. My flow is going to be tangential to the direction that the filtrate permeates, is the terminology we use. Uh, so my flow comes in and shears off the solids that are built up on the membrane. So this medium over here, that's my medium in the dashed line, is totally impermeable to the solids. I choose those openings so that they're much, much smaller than the particles. The particles cannot possibly move through there, only the fluid can. But because that's now such a small particle diameter, you can imagine that the moment any solids build up on there, your, your filtration pretty much stops. So what we have to do is keep feeding our feet in a tangential manner to wipe those solids away and remove them off. And they leave out in a different, um, different street. So we'll see this much, much more in the next, uh, next few weeks as we look at membranes. It's a different style of filtration, but the same equations hold. So with that as context, let's go back to this filtration equation that we that Claudia derived. And we've got our driving force up there in the numerator. I've got my two resistances in the denominator, the viscosity, and then, then on my right and left-hand side, it's determining the flow. Let's ask which of those variables in this list here are going to change over time. RC. RC will change over time. RM? No, it's going to be constant. Viscosity? Constant. Delta P? Change. Constant. Yeah, so delta P is the variable I can choose. So I can either operate my system with constant delta P or I can choose to change it. I can just let it, let it be whatever it, the pressure drop is. Okay? But in most cases, we can control that with feedback control to be exactly what we'd like it to be. Area, <coughs> constant, V. Does delta P changes as the uh, okay. resistance goes up? Does delta P change as the cake resistance builds up? Yes. Unless you change it. So if the cake resistance builds up, you apply a greater pressure. And in a, with the feedback loop, you can keep delta P constant. But if you don't change delta P, it's going to increase, increase by um, until you um, until you have feedback. Okay, so, so you we do need to apply some external um, system here to keep delta P constant for a constant pressure system. V, the volume of filtrate, is one of the variables in our derivative. It's definitely going to change with time. So dV by dt is going to change with time unless, again here, I alter my pressure in such a way to keep a constant flow of leaving. So start to think of this unit, it's not isolated, there's downstream units from it that are going to expect a certain flow of filtrate being pulled through this drum. So here's my rotary drum, I'm drawing a vacuum, the liquid passing through the cake into the drum and gets withdrawn over here. So V is a function of time leaving from the rotary drum filter. Same here with the filter press, the volume of fluid leaving, we saw there in the video, gets collected out of the plate and frame and leaves and goes to subsequent unit ops. There's many cases where we want this unit to operate with constant flow so the downstream units can operate at steady state. So we've got fit, a fair amount of flexibility here with this system on how we instrument it to either maintain what's called constant flow filtration or constant pressure filtration. Okay, so we'll see these two terms coming up. By far, the most useful system for us is what's called the constant pressure filtration 
easy to instrument with a single feedback loop. And that's, in fact, what we will, we will focus our attention on, the constant pressure filtration. The constant flow filtration can be implemented, but very often what you'll see downstream of these units is a holding tank which will buffer the variable flow rate. But um, we'll, we'll focus on constant pressure filtration. Yeah. Um, he asks that um, when you change RSD, does that put the pressure, right? Okay, and we say we're going to keep um, P constant. How do you keep P constant if RSD is going to change? Okay, so the question is, RC is changing how you're going to keep pressure constants. Yeah. So RC, as that cake builds up in thickness, RC gets higher and higher. Okay, we can adjust the pressure over there as well to counteract it. So simply apply a greater pressure drop to counteract the resistance. If you would like constant flow. Okay, so let's take a look back at that alpha term. Yeah. You can have both constant pressure and constant flow. Can you have both pressure, constant pressure and constant flow? Yeah. You pick one or the other. Yeah. Let's go look back at alpha. There was, we substituted in earlier for it, but we need to look back at how it's made up again. So we have this alpha term um, that's inside RC. So RC was a function of alpha. Um, that equation for RC is over there. So there's RC. RC was equal to the volume of filtrate multiplied by slurry concentration times alpha over area. Filtrate volume is constant. CS I know. Area I know. Alpha. Alpha is actually the reason why RC over there is changing. Let's go look back at alpha. Alpha is this constant K1 the voyage multiplied by the specific surface area and the, and the density of the particle. So two terms in there are changing. The packing voyage as well as the S0, the specific surface area per unit volume. S0 probably won't change by very much. It's, it's likely almost negligible. And let's just solve it for D form. So we assume that mostly constant, but where this does change is with epsilon. That packing voyage will change with time, depending on the chemistry of the solid's surface and how repellent there are to neighboring particles, as well as the pressure being applied to the system. As we apply greater pressure with packing and forcing those particles closer and closer, that voyage will change. What is this here? S0 is the specific surface area of the particle. So area of particle per meter cube. So what we'll do then is we'll let, we recognize that alpha is going to change, and alpha is going to change as a function of pressure. What we say then is let alpha equal some base alpha multiplied by a pressure drop raised to the power f. So it's going to change, it's, alpha is going to get larger in proportion to our pressure and with some power f. We're going to model that pressure dependency of alpha and that rate. So what you'll see then on the next slide is that I've got alpha over there is a function of pressure. I also have pressure in the numerator. So two, two appearances of pressure now in this equation. So we, we pretty much always assume that that's not it changes negligibly? Because it is square too, right? Yeah, so it changes negligibly, pretty much. Fair assumption. So if we go back to our filtration equation, we have this, this volume changing with time as a function of the, the driving force in the numerator and the resistance in the denominator. We can just flip the equation, so invert it. And the next step is to separate out the two terms. I'd like to create a term that will account for the resistance of the medium, and then another term that accounts for the resistance due to the cake in blue over there. And what we'll, what we'll call then is this all this term, the resistance due to the medium, will lump up into a single variable B, a constant B, and then another constant for our cake, resistance. So all of that except V. And the reason why we keep V separate is because uh, V is, a, is part of the derivative term over here, dt by dV. And so we're going to integrate with respect to that volume of filtrate. So the equation down here, dt by dV, is going to is telling me how my filtrate volume is changing with time 
as a function of medium resistance and as a function of cake resistance. So consider this situation where we've got constant pressure. If our delta P is constant, then which other terms are constant? Well, my viscosity of the system is constant. The slurry concentration is alpha now is also constant. Because we called, we said alpha is going to be a function of delta P. So if I'm assuming constant pressure through some sort of feedback control mechanism, it's fairly easy to implement a constant delta P. Alpha is also going to be constant. My area is constant. That term over there is constant, obviously. So all of those terms in blue are constant, which I'll call KP. Same idea here for the terms in orange. All those terms are constant as well, which is why we've created that new variable D. So the, in a constant pressure situation, the only thing that's actually changing with time is the rate of liquid coming out of my filter. So at, at the point of leaving over here, this V of T, we just look at, at the case of a plate and frame press, this volume is changing with time. Okay. As these solids build up and up, I'm getting more and more volume leaving <coughs> over here. But what is the expected plot of time versus volume over time? So I'm applying a constant pressure over there. How much filtrate as a function of time is going to be leaving? So initially, what's my initial condition? At time zero. The V of T is the volume of filtrate leaving. So we don't have feed. I mean, we have feed on this side, but V of T then, let's be clear, is the volume of filtrate. It's not the volume of liquid coming in. So V of T leaving the filter press is zero. Okay, so we've got that established. What would the curve look like after that? Take a, take a, few, a minute or two and draw it. And that uh, equation on the board there will help you. integrating the curve, uh, sorry, integrating this equation, you can create a, an equation that will tell you the time to filter for a given volume V. 
So this is the time I need to operate my filter for to achieve a certain volume V given these two constants B and KP. So I need to know my cake resistance that's wrapped up into KP, my cake resistance. I also need to know my medians resistance that's wrapped up into that B term. If I know those two, two constants, I can then predict the time to achieve a given volume of filtrate. And that's, that's of interest to us. When we design these plate and frame filter presses, we run them for a certain period of time, but we don't just keep going and going because as we see here, there's going to be diminishing returns. We operate the plate and frame press for a certain time, stop, empty out the solids, clean it, and then start over again. Okay, then with a new batch of filtrate going up. Okay. The reason why we don't just keep operating it is because I, I'm just, I'm constantly, even for this period of time, that small additional amount of volume that I'm getting, I'm putting in all that energy delta P for very little return of volume of filtrate coming out. So there comes a point in time where you need to stop the, the press, empty it out, and restart it again. So you rather spend your energy um, more usefully. Okay, so rather than trying to counteract this building cake, cake layer, rather just stop, clean it up, restart it again. So there's a cycle time in these units, which you which you'll see. Now, some practical things. We've spoken about how we get constant delta P with, with the simple feedback loop. Which type of equipment, which type of pump I should be more specific, will be able to provide you a constant pressure pump? Says then that when we're operating a constant pressure drop, our, that packing voltage is going to be constant. So is alpha, and then so is the cake. Um, that's not like RC. That, and not the, delete this. RC won't be constant because the cake thickness is building up, so RC will go up and up. So delete that last RC. So alpha is epsilon is constant, and so is alpha. So here's here's how we go about this system. So, um, we, let's just visualize that again quick. You're in your lab, you put your slurry in over there. This doesn't look very, uh, like as much solids in there, but typically there'd be solids suspended in that slurry, and you apply a vacuum and draw out your, um, draw out your, your filtrate. Uh, now these units can be instrumented to operate at constant pressure as well. You measure the vacuum, leaving over here and you apply a greater vacuum to, in order to maintain your delta P. So these lab equipment can be used for constant pressure filtration. And what we do is we'll, we'll, med, we'll put in a certain quantity of slurry and with your stopwatch you stand there and when it reaches certain heights along the demarcation, you record the time taken to achieve a certain volume of filtrate. So here for example in this experiment, the person has recorded it took 19 seconds to get half a liter, 38 seconds to get one liter, and so forth. So if you plot those data, T versus V, you'll see this, uh, this sort of shape to the curve as well. So I encourage you to do that at home. That's something that you, sh you should consider. What I'd like you to do next, though, however, is to rather plot V, the volume of filtrate on your x-axis, against T divided by V, on your y-axis. So draw a rough sketch based on these numbers up here to get that.
what does that curve look like? First part of the BT of the D versus T curve. So it looks like the curve. The earlier curve we had. No, I pick the axis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So V, the volume of filtrate on the x-axis versus time taken to get that volume divided by the volume itself. Why? T over V on the y-axis, V on the x-axis. So this is standard. If any of you work in solids processing industry, you'll, you'll be seeing these sorts of experiments on a regular basis. This is exactly how these units are sized to get estimate the resistances. So what you'll notice is if you plot those data, it looks something along the lines of this. There's this initial period where it seems to be fairly flat and then rising linearly. Okay? So the general shape of these curves are a linear trend and you'll notice this initial part over here. So the, initially when we've got low filtrate volume with a flat line and then we sort of rise up and go up at a constant rate. Okay. What we will do then is we typically ignore this. Okay. This is right at the beginning of the filtration step where that cake is just building up on the media. And it's what what we'll see sometimes is called as the constant flow region. So it's just when you start that filtration step, you're actually not able to achieve constant pressure for a very few seconds, 10, 15, uh, some, on the larger units it's maybe about a minute of time, where just after you've cleaned it and started it out, you get actually what's called constant flow. Then you move into the constant pressure region, and then this curve takes off like that. The reason why that this curve is linear is if we take that starting point equation we derived earlier, after integrating, we can achieve this equation. Divide both sides by V, we get T over V is equal to V plus KPV over 2. So here is in the form of Y is some constant for your intercept plus a slope <coughs> times uh, x, the volume of v. So my slope actually is kp over 2. And my intercept is equal to v. So that's how we estimate that constant v and the constant kp, is by plotting one of these curves at a constant delta p. For a given delta p, I can estimate the intercept and slope. And in this particular example, what you'll find is the intercept is equal to 27 <coughs> seconds per meter. And the slope in this example is equal to 10.7 seconds per meter squared. And so the data are. Um, here for you to try it out. Also, this example is on the course uh, website in the spreadsheet for you to look at. And if we take that further now, we can go calculate the resistance of the medium Rm and the resistance, the specific cake resistance alpha. So what I'd like you to do is try to answer question three and four and five in the minutes that remain. We, we should be able to see what those numbers are and then we can actually verify in the system whether Rn really is smaller than Rc. We'll, we'll see there's something interesting there. Okay. So, okay, so actually, yeah, let's quickly talk about that. The question is, shouldn't the intercept be 37? No, so the intercept is if you take that projection out and down to V equals zero, you get 27. Okay. And what you'll do is, what you'll notice is that that first data point of 0.5 and 19, that's actually this point over here. So initially you get this constant happening, 30, 37, 38 on the y-axis, that's so roughly constant initially. So to calculate our slope, we ignore that first data point. So the slope is calculated without the data point. Project that down, it gets out to 27 down.
Okay, so use that slope and intercept information to calculate what R M is. you're using the same slurry that you would be using on your large filter press later on. Also, the type of the cake, uh, sorry, the type of medium you use is the same type of medium that you'll use later on in the plate and frame filter press. So that when you estimate that medium resistance here in this situation, you get an estimate for the future that works. Okay, so use the same filter cloth in your larger units over here. You should go and put it over there and the same type of slurp. So what's the approach for calculating RF? What's the equation that one would use? Sorry? And what is it? Is it the stopping over area multiplied by the times R F? Right, so B, the intercept B. is equal to 27 seconds per meter. So let's just work in SI from here because all our, our derivations are in SI units. So that's 27,000, but B is also equal to A, the cross-sectional area, times delta P. So B is equal to the viscosity times the resistance due to the cake divided by the cross-sectional area times the pressure drop. So solving that then RM, we know our viscosity of the liquid, we know our cross-sectional area, we know our pressure drop, and we can solve that for RM. In this case is equal to 8.1 times 10 to the 11, uh, 10 to the 10, and it has units of universe meters. So you can plug in at home and just verify that number. The specific cake resistance, alpha, that's going to be wrapped up in the slope term. So the slope was 10.7 seconds per meter squared. Multiply that by 1,000 squared to get liters into volumetric SI units. And that's equal to Kp over 2 was our slope. Which after simplifying and so to from the derivative. 
derivation of Kp, we had set that equal to the viscosity times the slurry concentration times alpha over A squared of delta P. But I've got a problem here, I don't know alpha. But uh, I mean, that's just like, I'm thinking ahead to RC. Um, to get RC, I need alpha, and here I can solve this one for alpha. So alpha rearranged for in that equation and sub in the values you can prove is 1.87 times 10 to the 11 meters per kilogram. Okay, so we know our viscosity, we know our slurry concentration is given as three. It's 24 kilograms of solids per meter cube of filtrate. We know our cross-sectional area and that constant pressure growth. The final step which I was heading towards is to calculate the cake resistance RC. RC is a function of alpha. It is equal to Cs times V times alpha over A. We had said that resistance due to the cake as that term. But because V is changing with time, V is always an increasing function of time. We're always getting more and more filtrate over time, although with diminishing returns. But V is always going up. So RC is also going up. CS stays constant. That's my slurry concentration. The area remains constant. And alpha remains constant for under the assumption of constant pressure filtration. So the only reason why RC is increasing is because we're putting down more and more solids and getting greater filtrates leaving. So RC then has to be determined at a, at a specific point in time. It's not constant here. And so we can compute RC at various points in time. And the worst RC is that one at the end of the filtration at 280 seconds. So again, prove it at home and with calculating it, it's 2.56 times 10 to the 11. And it has units of in this length. So quick comparison then just to end off here is here we've got the resistance due to the medium is 8 times 10 to the 10. The resistance due to the cake is 2.56 times 10 to the 11. Okay. I had said earlier that, some, that Rm is sometimes much, much smaller and negligible compared to Rc. In this case, they're actually not. For this small batch experiment, Rm is pretty comparable. As, okay, it's about one third the size of Rc, so it's not small enough to ignore. And then in some of our future examples, as that batch progresses in time, Rc will become so much larger that Rm can be ignored. So this is a recap then, assignment one is up here at the front to collect and uh, those handing in paper form for assignment two.